Chapter 4 Cave Valley of Kings The ruins found the jungles of South America are spectacular enough but there are few places in the world that have captured the collective mind of mankind more than the necropolis at Giza in Egypt. Figure 70 for years many furious debates have raged concerning the construction of the complex especially Great Pyramid and many people have proposed numerous different ideas on the methods that were employed in the task. Theories have been put forward concerning huge stone blocks rolled into place on logs via great earthen ramps. Elaborate pulley systems. Massive stones transported from far off quarries by river barges. Counterweights. Sand traps. Armies of slaves doomed to generations of pulling and lifting, and many other theories. Alien help has been suggested and even levitation. But for all the myriad of ways that have been suggested, every one can be found to contain flaws and none can yet provide an adequate explanation that accounts for all the variables. There are many ancient steel and paintings that exist depicting almost every conceivable aspect of everyday ancient Egyptian life but have you ever considered that not one exists that depicts the building of the pyramids or of people ever even man handling massive stone blocks? Ultimately no one really seems to know who it was done by or how it was done, not yet. The Great Pyramid The Great Pyramid is the largest and most controversial of the three large Giza pyramids. It stands at one side of the three. It's not the one in the middle with the limestone casing still intact near its summit as many erroneously believe but is in fact the pyramid behind that one, the one that has been completely stripped of its limestone casing and is missing the capstone. The missing capstone is an intriguing mystery all on its own. But before we continue, some facts about the Great Pyramid must be taken into account, if only to answer the question, why all the debate? So please first consider these rather interesting points. The Great Pyramid Figure 71 is about as high as a 40-story building and contains an estimated 23 million blocks of rectangular limestone, each weighing an average of 2.5 tons though the exact number is still an issue for contention and recent X-rays have revealed there actually may be as little a half that amount. The blocks are fitted together so precisely that a thin knife blade cannot be inserted between any of them. In its finished state it was covered with smooth limestone casing stones which created a surface that weathered to harden and become smoother and shinier with age causing the pyramid to reflect the sun and shine brightly from a distance. Napoleon described it as shining like a diamond on the distant horizon. It is said that in those days it was actually visible from Palestine. Its sides rise up from the ground at a uniform 51 degrees and it is almost perfectly square and level. So great is its accuracy that no other structure that has been built, either before or since, is comparable to it. Even those buildings constructed recently using modern laser methods cannot equal the accuracy of this single ancient stone structure. The method employed to square and level the base prior to commencing its construction is also a total mystery because, to make matters even more difficult, a large hump of bedrock exists near the center of the base of the pyramid which actually protrudes into the mass of the pyramid itself. Figure 72 This hump of protruding bedrock is nowhere near level which means that a standard 4, 5, 6 method of squaring the base could not have been used and yet the first layer of blocks have been laid directly and fitted perfectly onto this bedrock base to create a perfectly level second layer. The Great Pyramid is accurately aligned to true north, not magnetic north which would have been a lot easier more accurately than any other existing structure built either before or since. Creating various equations using its measurements produce results that give us the distance from the Earth to the Sun, the distance from the Earth to the Moon, the diameter of the Earth. The radius of the Earth at the equator, the length of the solar, sidereal and anomalistic years and the mathematical formula of pi, thousands of years before it was discovered, just to name a few. If it is indeed a tomb as we are told then the Great Pyramid has also somehow been constructed in the most difficult way imaginable, even to the extent that it would appear the builders were looking for the hardest way possible to build a structure. The building and layout of the stone blocks is indeed so remarkable with the blocks fitted together to such a degree of precision and in such an unusual fashion that even the most sophisticated, 
scientifically minded construction teams have not been able to replicate it even a scientific team who tried using laser cut styrofoam and glue. It contains so much stone that it could swallow within its structure. All of St. Paul's Cathedral, Westminster Abbey in London, St. Peter's in Rome, and the cathedrals of Florence and Milan without even bulging at the sides. The sides of the Great Pyramid are not flat. There is actually a slight indentation that runs up the middle of each side starting in a flat triangular section in the middle of each side figure 73. These indentations were not noticed until the mid-20th century when an aerial photograph was taken of the pyramid. These new points have provided scholars with new points of reference for various measurements but they also raise some more intriguing questions. Remember, the Great Pyramid used to be covered with a polished limestone casing that was flat and smooth, completely obscuring these indentations. So why on earth were they put there in the first place? And then, after completing such a feat of perfect construction, why then cover them up with casing stones? What on earth was the point to such an exercise? However, because the indents are there, we can now measure from one corner to the other i.e. A, B, we can measure across the bend to all points i.e. A, D, E, B and we can measure from one corner to the top of the flat triangle to the other corner i.e. A, C, B. Please know that all measurements are done in pyramid inches and sacred cubits. A pyramid bench is 0 1 1 larger than a standard inch while one sacred cubit is 25 pyramid inches. This method of measurement is only found at Giza, the youth, and Stonehenge and is the same method of measurement that is used and described in the Bible for such things as the two arcs. Interestingly, the distance between points A, B is 365.242 sacred cubits the exact length of the solar year. The distance across the indentation between points A, D, E, B is 365.256 cubits, the exact length of the sidereal year. The distance between points A, C, B is 365.259 the exact time it takes from Earth to return to its perihelion, the anomalistic year. When a circle is made by using the arc created by the indentation, the circumference of the circle is the same as the circumference of the Earth at the equator. And yet the casing stone were flat. Why were these incredibly accurate measurements purposely contained in the stonework beneath them? In the king chamber is a hollowed out stone block rising from the stone of the chamber floor that appears to have been fashioned by an as yet unknown means that we are told was where the sarcophagus would have lay. Because of the placement of the stone blocks, passageways and hollow spaces above the chamber the room is extremely resonant, causing the entire pyramid to ring like an enormous bell when this hollow stone block is struck. What purpose does all this serve? Coincidence. Still an impossible feat of engineering by today's standards, the Great Pyramid just stands there elegantly and defiantly before us, an absolute marvel of construction and mathematics, a complete mystery and a true wonder, by any measure. So how did it all get there? Who built it? How was it done and why was it built at all? Why on earth go to so much trouble and use such a bizarre and difficult design? And why incorporate so much mathematic, scientific and astronomical information into its measurements? The Great Pyramid is commonly believed to be the work of the Pharaoh Khufu also known as Cheops. Construction of the pyramid is said to have taken place during the reign of Khufu about 4500 years BT at around 2500 BC while the Sphinx is thought to have been constructed at a later date, presumably within Khufu's son Khufra's lifetime. Therefore the pyramid is presumed to be slightly older than the Sphinx. We are told that the smaller pyramid of three found at the Giza complex was built by the Pharaoh Menkera. These are the mostly accepted theories and indeed are widely taught as fact by Egyptologists and in schools throughout the world. Some of the main reasons given for coming to these conclusions and believing that the timeline of 2500 BC is correct are as follows. There exists in the Giza Valley near to the Great Pyramid, the steel that mentions the name of Khufu. The pyramid is said to be the final resting place for Khufu, though no remains have ever been reported to have been found inside. There is also an inscription within the pyramid itself, 
located on a wall in a small antique chamber in a roof section above the king's chamber appearing in a manner similar to graffiti which also bears the name Khufu. There was a mummy retrieved from the smaller pyramid in 1837 that was reported to be the remains of Menkura that is also widely believed to validate the theories. But there are serious problems with this reasoning. The Sphinx The Sphinx figure 74, located in the Giza complex close to the Great Pyramid, is perhaps the most controversial structure in all Egypt. It is carved directly out of the surrounding stone of the plateau and many large blocks have been excavated around it to clear the area. The removed blocks were later used to build the Sphinx temple that sits nearby. The Sphinx raises a number of interesting questions that beg for explanations but for the purpose of this work the only questions we really need to answer are Who really built it? And When was it done? The Sphinx is believed by academics to have been built by Khafre who was a son of Khufu and to have been constructed around 2450 BC. This is because in between the paws of the Sphinx there is a steel that bears the inscription Khaf. The theory is also said to be corroborated by several statues of Khafre that were found in the temple next to the Sphinx and mainly because one of the statues was in the form of a Sphinx. It is also said by many scholars that verification of who built the Sphinx is quite simple as the face depicted on the statue is clearly that of Khafre and that this can be verified by a simple examination of the many statues, busts and carvings of Khafre that still exist today. But there are also serious and very obvious flaws with this theory. Investigations of the facts Although both these theories are still presented to us as fact, the evidence we have been presented with to validate them both is flimsy and circumstantial at best. In reality, the theory that Khufu and Khufu were responsible for the monuments and that they were built as elaborate tombs has long been disproved. There is an abundant amount of new evidence to suggest otherwise and it is now well known by many scholars that the pharaohs of Egypt were in fact, not the builders of the Giza complex. In truth, and contrary to common public belief, Nothing has ever actually been found in any of them to confirm or even seriously suggest the pyramids were ever tombs in the first place. When examining the Sphinx we should take into account that the ancient Egyptians went to great pains to produce accurate depictions of their rulers and this can be seen in the various surviving statues we have of them. Many of these statues are quite detailed, even capturing facial expressions and the genuine non-symmetry and subtle variations between one side of the face and the other. It therefore seems safe to assume that they would have also have strived for a certain degree of accuracy when building statues. Using today's face recognition techniques and computer technology several stark contrasts between the Sphinx and the face we know as Khufu become very apparent. But any layman can't just apply basic geometry to compare the angles of the Sphinx to those of Khufu figure 75. Such comparison clearly shows that the profile of the Sphinx differs totally to that of Khufu. The angles and general shape of the profile is all wrong. At just a glance at the Sphinx, the cheeks are too prominent. The jawbone the wrong shape, the brow too pronounced and the ears too high. This can then be confirmed further by observing the number of glaring differences that also become apparent when using the same simple geometry to compare the facial angles in the front views of the two faces figure 76. As we can see, the jaw is too wide, the mouth is wrong, the eyes are the wrong shape and the ears, ah yes those ears. It suffices to say. The two statues simply don't look anything like each other. I mean, sure there's one head with two eyes, two ears, one mouth, the remnants of a nose and the same standard Egyptian headdress but that's where the similarities end. The nose is thought to have been blown off by Napoleon's forces, though this is also heavily debated.